Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to the evening service of New Life in Christ Church. Let me uh, give us a call to worship with uh, John 1, 1 and 1, 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Please stand. And we will sing hymn number 302.
Father, we're so grateful that we can come this evening into your presence. We're grateful for the many blessings that you give us each and every day. We pray, Father, your spirit would be here, that Christ would be lifted up. We pray that as Roger brings your word and opens it up to us, Lord, that your word would penetrate our hearts and our minds and our lives would be changed. We do pray in Christ's name. Amen. Jesus Christ, and when in glory shall I will sing 
of this old story that rescued me. Praise you, my Savior, the King of life. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise you, my Savior, the King of life. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Please be seated. Um, in the evening service, as we go through the Westminster Shorter Catechism, now the Westminster Shorter Catechism is a summary of the Bible's teaching on, on certain topics. Um, some people have a problem with, with confessions and creeds. I don't because the book of Jude in, chapter, in verse 3, it says that it's the faith once delivered unto the saints. And so this, this, the confession was written in uh, 1647. And so we're not inventing something new in our interpretation of the Bible. The faith once delivered to the saints is the faith of the ages. And so, and so that's why this summary is a good summary across the whole of Scripture of what the Scriptures teach on these, on these questions. So let's look at the first one. Question 30. I'll, I'll read the bold and you follow with the, uh, the light print. How doth the Spirit apply to us the redemption purchased by Christ? The Spirit applieth to us the redemption purchased by Christ by working faith in us and thereby uniting us to Christ in our effectual calling. What is effectual calling? Effectual calling is the work of God's Spirit, whereby convincing us of our sin and misery, enlighten our minds in the knowledge of Christ, and renewing our wills, he doth persuade and enable us to embrace Jesus Christ freely offered to us in the gospel. What benefits do they that are effectually called partake of in this life? They that are effectually called in this life partake of justification, adoption, and sanctification, and the several benefits which in this life do either accompany or flow from them. Time that will echo 
down through eternity. And my grace will stand on your promises, and my faith will walk as you walk with us. Speak, O Lord, till your church is built and the earth is filled with your glory. That is our prayer as we're here today and as we look towards 2024, as the Lord would speak, speak to us through his word that we would hear as the Holy Spirit works the truth of God's word into our hearts. Um, we want to take a few minutes to pray as the scriptures call us to, uh, which the scripture says, first of all, then I urge supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. I desire then that in every place men should pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or quarreling. So we want to spend a few minutes now uh, praying, uh, and we usually open it up for the congregation to be able to have any anything that we could be praying for tonight. We'd like to know what we could be praying for, so if you'd like to share that, we would like to be able to hear that and pray for it. Uh, tonight. Uh, thank you all for being here. It's great on a first Sunday night on in 2024 to have so many people here at our evening service. So it, it's great to worship and just hear your voices and the chorus that goes up. It really is a huge joy. So very good to worship with you. Um, I have a few things from this morning I want to pray for, but is there anything else that, that we should be praying for? Kim. All right, you know, what is her name again? Kathy. Kathy. So this is uh, Kim Laurie's mother. Uh, after she visited here, she went home, caught COVID-19 there. She's 93, so we're going to pray for her recovery. So thank you. Ted, Nancy. Uh, yeah. uh, our uh, daughter, she and her husband went on ski vacation in Japan, and she caught pneumonia. Okay. She seems to be doing okay. <laughs> I got pneumonia. Is she still in Japan? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's Ted and Nancy Hanline's daughter. daughter what is her name? Anna? Anna. Okay, so we'll pray for Anna, who is in Japan with pneumonia. Nancy, something else? And my, my brother Tom, who lives in Ohio, is being hospitalized with uh, an infection, and he's having trouble breathing. So we pray for him as well. Hospitalized where? Uh, in Ohio. Hospitalized. Tom. Ohio. So Nancy's brother Tom, hospitalized in Ohio. What does he have? No infection. Okay. We'll pray for him. Thank you. Other things we could be praying for? Ellen. Amen. So, Ellen, I want us to pray for those who are uh, dealing with serious mental illness challenges. They would stay on the path that leads to Jesus Christ and the hope that's there. So we'll pray for that. Ellen, thank you. Got other things to pray for tonight. All right. Yes, Daniel. We will pray for the witness of our college students as they go back to school. Thank you, Daniel, for that. Good. All right. Yeah, Kim.
significant God's provision has been for them and the opportunity to share that uh, with the youth in this church uh, is amazing. Yeah, so Caleb mentioned um, that our oasis, we had Josh and Elisa Wassum speaking and they shared a uh, big part of their testimony of where uh, she, of her, especially her kidney transplant a couple of years ago and uh, what a, a bit of providence that was for her. Um, and we think of that even as we consider Joe Bella and his need of a kidney transplant and, and healing right now. We want to keep him in prayer as well. So praise God for that and we're grateful for her, her sharing her testimony this week. All right, with that, oh, another one, Fred. Amen. Amen. All right. Oh, Roger. Praise God. Yeah, so uh, Kelly has been witnessing to a, a neighbor. We have a little Bible study going, and her name is Terry, and a neighbor's of there. And so Lord is doing a work in her life, but um, we continue to pray for her growth, and, and, and she wants to be baptized, right? And so praise, praise God for that. So we'll pray for your continued ministry to her. Thanks for sharing that. Thank you. All right. All right. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do come to you today, and, and our prayer is that you would speak, O oh Lord, speak into our lives, speak into our hearts. You've given us your word. You've spoken definitively there, but Father, we need you to bring that word from uh, those pages and bring them into our heart, that they would have a work in us, Father, making us into that image of Christ that you want to create in each one of us. And so do that work. And as we start 2024, Father, that is our prayer. Father, would you do that work in us? And would you do that work in us as a congregation as well? Father, that the word of Christ would dwell deeply within us. Father, that you would um, continue, as Fred said, to keep us on our mission to make Christ known. That, Father, you would build your church in terms of, of being a family together and in searching your word together and supporting and praying for each other. We pray, Father, that you would um, just direct us in this new year. May Christ be great. May Christ be magnified in and among us this day. Father, we do lift up our, these prayer requests to you uh, today. Um, just this, earlier today, New Life Korean Church celebrating their seventh anniversary with Pastor Sam preaching. We rejoice in that and pray, God, for this Korean church as they continue to meet here and reach our community. As they see new members coming in, we pray, God, you'd bless and lead them in their work here. Father, we do, um, we do, uh, we want to continue to pray for healing. Uh, we pray for Joe DiBella and Ricardo Perez, Kevin Ritchie, Stan Roberts, Ellen. It's good to see her today after this week. Jimmy Thomas as he's suffering some debilitating uh, sickness and life-threatening sicknesses right now. We pray, God, you'd be with him and with Robin, uh, Father, to heal him and heal him completely of body, soul, and spirit. Father, to and also to support her um, at this time as she cares for him. Father, we, as we look up, we see this balcony, which is just about finished, and all that is there, and we look forward to um, being back into one service and what you're going to do there. Um, and so thank you for all the work that's there, and help us to see the opportunities that are ahead. And as, even as we come together for Focus Day next week, direct our eyes upward towards you. Father, you're the one where our help comes from, and so we look to you as our only hope in these times. Father, we do pray, um, as this is today, the anniversary of, the, of that vicious terrorist attack in Israel, and, and it's just upset the whole world, and it's certainly upset um, the churches that we're friends with over in Israel, over in Palestine, and with these pastors that we know, and as they care for their congregations, Father, um, in both those areas, would you give wisdom and grace 
insight to there. Thank you for the Jerusalem Gateway Partnership and the 45,000, 46,000 they were able to raise to help um, with the pastors and their, their needs-based uh, ministry that they're both doing. And we pray, Father, that you would uh, bless that work. Father, we do pray for Kim Laurie's mother as she recovers from COVID-19 or COVID. And just pray, God, you'd help her for Kathy with that, for Ted and Nancy's daughter in, in Japan and Anna and helping her as she recovers from pneumonia there. And her brother Tom, who's hospitalized in Ohio. Father, would you heal him? Father, as, as each deals with these sicknesses, help them to look up and look to Christ. Father, as Ellen mentioned, there, is, there are those who struggle with serious mental illnesses um, just all around us. And Father, just in sometimes silently suffering in these times. Father, there are those who um, the darkness is so deep. Father, they don't know that there is any way out. And I pray, God, for those that are, that, there were, that, that they would see the light that is in Christ and the hope that's in him, to be able to hang on another day, to look towards Christ as their hope, to surround them with people, maybe us who, who encourage them in the word of God and to be able to come alongside and pray for them and to remind them of your love and to remind them of our love. And so, Father, as we think about that and that mission part that we have, we do pray, Father, that you would um, shine the light of Christ brightly, Father, through us, the ministry of the gospel to those who are, who are struggling. Father, many um, will return back to college, as Daniel Lehman reminded us, and we do pray for our students and their witness that are on these campuses, and pray, Father, that you do work in our college students, uh, renewing, reviving, encouraging them, and helping them find good Christian uh, friendships, but also to be witnesses, to shine brightly the gospel of Christ, and that the difference um, would be seen in, in love and devotion. Father, we're thankful for Josh and Elisa Wassum just hearing that story again today and to pray for our youth just to be marveled at your providence, to be marveled at your, your kindness and the, your sovereignty and to be amazed in that. And do continue to pray for her, for Lisa and her good health. And uh, we do pray, continue to pray for Joe DeBella as he searches for kidney health and a transplant or um, and with the, this 12 hours or so of dialysis he has every day. Father, sustain and carry him. Father, as uh, Fred's mentioned, Father, we just ask you to help us to keep on our mission to make Christ known around the world. Father, we do pray for Erica Casare and Zagros. Zagros is still waiting for his, um, for his um, visa so that he can come to the United States, Father, to escape this persecution that he's under. Um, and we do pray, God, you'd keep him safe and you'd open up these immigration channels for him to be here. Father, we, um, I want to pray for Ariana Verboski. She continues to serve in Nigeria. Uh, on, and we do pray for your protection and care for her and her team and, and help them to have continued effective work in making Christ known there. Uh, so lead them in that work. And, and uh, we do pray for um, Roger and Kelly's neighbor, Terry. And Father, thank you for the work you're doing in her life and the, the Bible study they've been able to have and her interests in spiritual things. Would you continue to help her to grow in Christ? And Father, as Roger comes to exhort us in your word, we pray, God, that you'd bless him as he blesses us. Thank you, God, for um, the gifts that you've given to him, the ones he wants to share with us today. And so uh, we just thank you for his investment in exhorting us tonight. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Roger, thank you for your ministry. Brother. Good evening, everybody. Good. Um, so it's been a little while since I've done this, so bear with the rust as we knock that off. And um, I want to thank the session for trusting me to do this. It's a, uh, I understand what it is like to allow someone to stand in the pulpit and presume to say, thus saith the Lord. And so I want to thank you for that. Uh, before we start, you mind if I pray for you as well? I know Sean just pray, Pastor Sean just prayed for us, but uh, if you will, let's, let's just pray for a second. Father God, I, I thank you for these men and women who are sitting here. I thank you for your word, which brings life to us. Tonight, God, I pray that you would move in our hearts. I pray, God, that you would cause us to gaze in wonderment at, uh, at our bridegroom, Christ. I pray, Father, that you would cause a longing to build in our heart, that we would pant after you, that you would call to our memory and to our uh, minds, those things that we pant after that are lesser than Christ. 
I pray, Father, you cleanse our hearts and our minds, that you would renew our minds, that our minds, like Pastor Sean shared with us this morning, would be set on Christ, that it would be fixed on Christ, Lord. I pray you do that work in our hearts tonight. I pray you do that work in our minds tonight. I pray you, that you would enable us in our lives to live like that. So, Father, I pray you would anoint your word as it's uh, faithfully uh, taught and expounded upon. I pray, Father, you'd be with us tonight. I pray for Sean and his 50th birthday celebration. Uh, after this, thank you for 50 great years and for a man of God like him. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. So I was going to teach on the fragrance of Christ. I love that passage. If you remember, it's a passage that talks about how uh, the fragrance of Christ is either a fragrance of death or a fragrance of right, life to certain people. However, just before Thanksgiving, uh, an event happened in our life that uh, the Lord used to stir me a little bit. A young man decided to come by our house, and uh, around Thanksgiving time, just after Pastor Sean in the session said, hey, would you like to exhort the church? I said, sure. I was preparing that message, and this young man, Brett, came by our house, and he happens to be friends and or dating my daughter, Lisa, and the discussion ensued, and Brett said, uh, I would like to ha ask you for your, your daughter's hand in marriage, to which I probably said no, and then we explained it, and it's a big, long story. But that sort of upset our house a little bit. It was exciting, um, and so over the New Year's holiday, we had the opportunity to throw an engagement party for Lisa, and she got to display Mount Everest on her finger to everyone, which was awesome. Um, but when this happened in Thanksgiving, it caused me to, to pause for a minute and go, okay, well, this is second daughter. Uh, you, you've taught me a little bit, Lord, so what do I do as a dad for the second daughter, the second and final daughter for an engagement party? What, what's, what do you say? What, what's the biblical basis for an engagement party? And so I did what everybody should do. I went to Scripture. And that's what we're going to do tonight. I'm going to share a little bit about what that journey uh, has revealed to me. Uh, I think it's, it could potentially be very encouraging. And tonight, I just kind of want to level set you as well. Um, this is an exhortation, and so it's a little less formal than normal, what you would normally have. And, and even if I was doing anything else, I would want to do this. I want to engage with you. So you're going to hear me ask you certain questions. Don't feel obligated. I'm not trying to play stump the chump. Please don't do that with me. Uh, I do have a direction that we're headed, so yes, I'm, I have an answer in mind, but whatever your answer, that's awesome. There's a wealth of knowledge the Lord had here, has here, so we're going to examine a few passages tonight. Two primarily, I want to tell you what those are here in a moment, and then there's, there'll be some other, I'll call them cats and dogs, not to be disrespectful to the word, but the, there's a bunch of supporting texts. The two primary texts that we're going to look tonight at, and it's not going to be a full exposition. We're not going to dig deep and look at the Greek and all those things. But um, these passages we're going to look at, they hold some, some fairly significant impact for us if we can see them through a specific lens and then embrace them through that lens. And so the passages we're going to look at tonight, and I'd ask one or two of you to maybe to uh, volunteer to read these passages. The first one is, comes out of Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 1, and we're going to read through verse 13. Can someone possibly volunteer to read that for us here in a moment? Matthew 25, looking at verse 1 through 13. Anybody? Excellent. Oh, oh we got right over here. Okay, and then you, if you want to take 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're going to begin in verse 13, and we're going to look at verse 18. Now, that's going to become, that's going to be in a minute, uh, and so when I look at you, I'll say, hey, 1 Thessalonians, please. Excellent. So, uh, everybody has Matthew chapter 25, and we're going to begin in verse 1, if you could read. Lord, Lord, open to us. For the answer said, Surely 
Assuredly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So how many people here have never heard that before? Everybody's heard that, right? I mean, we're pretty fam- we, we have a basic understanding of going, what's going on here. What, what's going on in this passage? What, what is happening? Those who were prepared, uh, the bridegroom accepted. Okay. Those who were not, God So the big takeaway commonly is, for this passage, is those who were prepared went in. Those who were not prepared didn't get to go in. Is, is that all that this passage is teaching, do you think? What else might it be teaching? Okay, well, so I obviously my daughter's getting married. So one of the very first verses you want to go to is like, well, let's talk about the. I I was thinking, what is a biblical engagement, right? And so as I studied through and looked, I'm like, okay, I don't think the way we do 21st century uh, engagements is biblical. Whoa, that's a big statement. Well, I don't see it in Scripture, right? And here's the reason why. It's because I was talking to, I was listening to Brett and Lisa, and they're doing nothing wrong. It's just cultural, right? So they're talking about um, what are we going to do? Where are we going to live? What's life going to look like? Where are we going to do holidays? And as we're talking around the little island in our house in the kitchen, because that's kind of where all the action happens in our house, some topic came up. And, and one of them said, rightly so, it's, this is how we do it in, in America. This is how we do it in the 21st century. And they said, well, but we're not married yet. I mean, what if we don't, what if we don't get married? And I'm like, well, that doesn't, that doesn't sound right. So that's why I went to the Ten Virgins. And so as I went here and I read this, to be honest with you, I found more questions than I had answers. I'm like, there's a couple of strange things in there. I kind of call them flyover phrases or flyover words or flyover concepts in Scripture, we all approach Scripture with a pre-understanding, right? And so when we see this passage, we've read it so many times, we've heard it so many times, oftentimes we can sort of miss some of the things going on in the passage or the bigger picture as to the reason why is this happening. And I think this may be one of those. For me anyway, it had way more questions. Here's the reason I, I say that. What I, what I tried to do is go, okay, I, I understand the Ten Virgins. That's not helpful for a 21st century engagement party. All right, let me read the context, right? Why do we do that? Because context is king, right? Context is king. So I rolled back, and so maybe someone can actually go back with me. And somebody read uh, chapter 24, and we'll just read verse 31 and maybe 36, please. Somebody, Matthew 24. 31 and 36. Go for it. Okay, so how many times have we heard those verses? A lot, right? Again, as I read context, this caused me way more concern and problems. Specifically that last verse, verse 36. It says this, right? It says, But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Well, my theological mind went, what? what?" And how many people have ever stumbled on that verse? Often we just fly over this verse and go, I, yeah, I'm sure they got it figured out. I know I'm a Trinitarian. I know that Jesus is the fullness of the Father. Uh, okay, let's just fly over that. That means something, right? Well, it actually does mean something, and it's very meaningful of what it means. Um, but there's a lot of quirky passages like this, especially when you look at the particular topic that's happening here. And just a little context. If you go back into, uh, to the beginning of chapter 24, what's happening is here, Jesus and his disciples have come out of the temple. He brought them over to the Mount of Olives. He sat down and began to st- uh, start teaching them. And they started asking him questions about the, his return and about the signs of the time. 
right? He said, okay, so what are the signs of the time? And then this passage unfolds. There's a, a number of other things that happened. And then we end up with the ten virgins. It doesn't help us much when we hear a verse saying in verse 31, it says, and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. Is it just me or is the trumpet call kind of weird? Why is there a trumpet call? Why is he sending out angels with a trumpet call? And they will gather his elect from the four winds of the heaven and the earth. And then I ask that we race to verse 36 and it upsets our apple cart. Concerning that day and hour, no one knows uh, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Okay? So I want us to live there in suspense for a minute with those couple problem verses. And we could look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 13. If you want to turn over there, please. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Um, go to all the way to 18, please. Yes. No, that's okay. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means receive those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Excellent. Thank you. Therefore, encourage or comfort one another with these words. So, what, what's trying to be a, uh, what jumps off the page at you, first of all? What, what is this passage about? What are the, what's the big rock issue that's happening here? Or a couple big rock issues. I, I will suggest a couple of verses for you. Look at verse, uh, where am I at? 13, verse 14, and verse 18. What are the big rocks that jump out at us there? Verse 13, what is it? Ignorance. What's that? Ignorance, Ignorance right? So he's telling us this so that we are not ill-informed or uninformed, right? In other words... The premise is he wants us to be informed about something, right? And, and in the context, it's about his return and about the people who fall asleep. Don't be ignorant about that. Okay, so that's good. Verse 13. What's happening in verse 14 that's kind of a big rock? Right? Grief. What about the grief? Oh, belief. Okay. Okay. What about belief? Okay. So we're looking at verse, uh, you're looking at verse which one, 14 or? Yes. 14. Let's read verse 14 really quick. For since we believe in Jesus Christ, died and rose, so through Christ, God will bring with him all those who are fallen asleep. Yep, you're right about that. And I'm, I've got that verse wrong. Um, so what, at a minimum here, what, what are the, the, what's happening in verse 18 too? So we need to believe, and then in verse 18, what's happening here? Let's read it. Therefore, build each other up or encourage each other for, or with these words. What words are we to build them up with? It's not a trick question. Which ones? The words of Jesus True, but in the context of this passage, he's giving us some information, right? So we're not ignorant. The resurrection of the dead, that's right. And what else? What else is in here that should be in, we can encourage each other with? Say again. Meeting the Lord. Meeting the Lord. Okay, so resurrection of the dead, we're going to meet the Lord. What does that mean? Where does that come from? What, what, what does it mean, meet the Lord in the air? That's kind of maybe one of those flyover passages there, right? It's like, what, what does that mean? So, so here's the thing. What are the, what, did any of the, anybody notice any kind of weird or sort of strange or tricky things that jump out at you and in this particular passage, it's routine for us, right? We, we've all read this thing probably a thousand times. So take a minute and just glance through verse 13 through 18 and ask your, do, do me a favor. Just say, okay, 
I don't know anything about this passage, this pericope, this group of scriptural passages. I know nothing of this pericope. And then read it. And, and allow yourself to see the strange or the weird. They're like, how does that help me encourage someone? Look for those things. I feel like doing a Jeopardy thing. Do, do, do. Yes. That's true. That's true. And so when, for us, though, we're to encourage people not as those that don't have hope. So in this passage, in this context, what's our hope? What hope is he talking about? Stan? Right? Okay. And they're going to rise up when? Isn't that a little weird? What's the trumpet for again? Why is there a trumpet? To announce what? His Why? Because this is it. Are we going to miss it? No. But this is, there, is it possible that something else is going on here? Why are the angels crying? Why are there an angel crying? Is anybody else? So these are the things I got from there, right? So... No, that's true. That's true. So why is it significant here? Because he's coming again, and those who didn't believe will, will fall to the wayside, and they will go where they go, and the rest will go with Christ. 100% true. Why the trumpet, though? Why the angel? There's a reason. I'm, I'm leading this down a, a road here. There's a reason for that, and it's really rich, in my opinion really rich. So here are the weird things that I have seen from here, see, that I wonder about. There's angels crying, shouting and crying angels. There's some coming of the Lord. There's some being caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And there's trumpet blasts, right? So, yes, go ahead. And the sermon's over. <laughs> no, that is exactly where we're going, right? That's exactly where we're going. Before we get there, though, there's a couple of things in order to get the entire cultural context of that statement, which is super deep and super rich. And I almost promise you, I won't 100% promise you because I'm not the Holy Spirit, but 99.9% .9 sure that when, you, when we hear it, you're going to go, oh, that's amazing. I see that now. And then when we read these passages... And those strange flyover uh, words and phrases and concepts, you're like, I, I, don't, I don't know why there's angels yelling. I, I don't know why there's trumpets. I, it's some stuff. But Jesus has come back. That's what I know. People need to get born again, right? Those flyover things are going to mean something to us. So do me a favor. Let's roll back about 10 verses. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and let's look at verse 3, and allow yourself to ask questions about this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. And we're just going to read the first part of it. So this whole context here, there's, uh, he's, he's, talk, he's um, encouraging them as about how they should walk and how they should behave. And then he says this, he says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. How many people have ever wondered what God's will is for you? Tag, there you go. Mem memorize ver this verse. Here's your memory verse. I'm sure the session will be okay with me saying that. Everybody has to memorize this verse. God's will for you is for you and me to be sanctified. Right? Does we all agree on that? Now, here's the question. Why is that important? Now, there's all kind of reasons. All kind of things flooded in your mind when I just said that, right? But in the context here, and all those crazy things here and the shouting and the trumpets and this sanctification piece, they all tie together potentially. And that's where we want to go here with this. So um, I think we all, as we already just said, we kind of all generally get the concept of, okay, so this whole Jesus returning thing is somehow tied to marriage and the marriage, getting married piece, right? We all kind of agree with that, right? Why? Why? 
Well, we've been, we've been taught that. That's right. Then that's a reason. The bride of Christ is the church, right? Why is that significant to us? How do we know that? Yes. And so where does it tell us that? Which we're going to get to. That's exactly right. We're his bride, and he's coming back for us. What picture is, are the biblical authors painting for us? What, what rubric are they providing us? What outline, what template are they giving us in order to read the coming and the second return of Christ? Anybody have any idea? Marriage. marriage. What type of marriage? Obviously not the 21st century type of marriage, right? I would suggest that what's being uh, illustrated here, what the template we've been given is the Jewish wedding system. The Jewish wedding system. That's what they're teaching here. Most of, many of the passages you see for the eschatological or the end time return of Christ can be applied in that way. And that's many of the things you see in here map right back to the Jewish wedding system. There's five things that generally happen in the ancient Jewish wedding system. There was the arrangement or, the, or the, where the father arranged for the bride uh, to get married to the son or arranged for the son for the bride, the bride to marry him. There was the betrothal period, which we'll talk about in a moment, right? There was the taking of the bride. There was the wedding ceremony. And then there's the wedding feast. We've all heard those before, right? Have, who has not heard those five before? It's okay to raise your hand. I'd heard, I've been known Christ for hundreds, not hundreds of years, tens upon tens of years. And until Lisa got engaged, I'm like, how does all that t- tie together? So let's take a minute and let's look at each of those different things here. Let's look at first the arrangement. In the Jewish system of weddings, in the arrangement of the marriage, it's the father who does the arranging. If you recall, in the Old Testament, uh, the servants of a father were sent out to get a bride for Isaac, right? And he went off, found the bride. What did he provide her? The bride's price. She came back, right? And they became what? Betrothed. In the betrothal process, so what happens is the father negotiates with the father of the bride. They negotiate a bride's price. They negotiate a marriage covenant. And then once the fathers are satisfied with that, the father of the groom sends the groom to the bride's house. He has a couple things in his hands. He has one is the bride's price, the price negotiated between the fathers. He also has a gift for the bride, more or less a surety for the bride. Normally there's a coin. It's become known most of the time now. It's a ring. It's something of extreme value. And then what they do is they go through the uh, betrothal ritual. They go over, and they also have, he also brings with him the betrothal covenant or the marriage covenant. They go through the ritual. They have a few blessings set over them. They ratify the betrothal covenant, normally by drinking a cup of wine or drink cups of wine together, which are potentially significant. That's a whole other teaching series. And then uh, what, after that's all done, what happens to the groom uh, when the betrothal is uh, all the tasks are completed. Where does the groom go? We know this. Where does the groom go? What did Jesus tell us that he's gone off to do and we're anxiously or anticipating with anticipation? He's gone off to prepare a place. Where? At the Father's house, right? And so the betrothal period is this, this period at least a year, sometimes it was far longer than that, where uh, the bride and the groom are considered to be legally married, unlike in the 21st century when they struck the covenant and they exchanged the gift and they ratified the betrothal uh, covenant, they were considered to be legally bound. How many people have heard the term already, but not yet in the context of theology? How many? Actually, raise our hands. For those of us that haven't, this particular concept maybe more than any other concept in all of theology and Scripture, fits the bill. Because when we we see a betrothed husband and wife, groom and bridegroom, or groom, a bridegroom and groom, uh, no, there's a groom who's the dude, and there's a woman who is the bride, those people. When we I told you there's going to be some rust. (laughs) And now I've lost my train of thought. Where was I? We, we, I really have lost my thought. 
Got it. There you go. So when they come together and, and they strike that covenant, they're legally bound. So they're already married, but they're not yet married. They don't live together. Is Jesus with us right now? Is, he, is Jesus himself with us right now? Well, the answer is no. His Holy Spirit is with us, which we're going to get to in a moment. But Jesus himself is where? Because he told us that. He told the disciples. He said, if I don't go, I can't send the Holy Spirit. Right? And so the, the gr- bridegroom went off to build a place for them. The bride herself with uh, anxious, not anxious, that's the wrong word, with excited expectation, stayed at her father's house and prepared. They prepared. One other thing, uh, it's been said, and, and I still haven't verified this, so I say this with a little timidity. Some have suggested that the cup that the bride and groom drank was the same cup that is drank at Sabbath. In other words, on the, the Friday and then Saturday, that's their Sabbath. And so there's a, a, a cup that they drink, which is a cup of, about purity. But the, the bride and the bridegroom actually did drink cups together, and, and they began to exchange information about their purity. For the bride, the betrothal period was all about that and about preparation. It was a year. Why do, we think, why do you think it was a year long? Wild imagination. She's a woman. Say again? Maybe. I mean, yeah, that's probably not it. But Well, see, that's the point, right? That's what I thought. Is it like the engagement you have now? How long does it take to plan a wedding? I mean, there's a lot to be done. You have to order flowers and all that stuff. Eh, maybe. Uh, but I think... Well, Yes, so remember 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. What is God's will for us? If, if what I'm suggesting, as you go and be bereaved yourself and study this out, if what I'm suggesting is true, and it's God's will for us to be sanctified, and the template of the Jewish wedding system is the thing that he is laying over the top of there, then a year long would be for What? For a woman who's betrothed to a man, the gestation period of a human being is approximately nine months, right? It's all about that. It was all about that, the purity of the woman. That's what it is. What is Jesus doing with us now, today? He's purifying us. His will for us is the same as it was for the bride in the ancient uh, Jewish context, right? He's purifying us. He's pre- he, the bride went back, or stayed at her father's house and she prepared to be a purified bride for her husband, right? We'll read that in a minute if we have time. In Revelation uh, chapter 19, you can look at it yourself, but it specifically calls that out, that the bride has been prepared for the room and made holy. And so, in the betrothal period, we have a groom, who, who they ratified this. He's off building a place. The bride is being purified. And then what happens? What's the third thing I mentioned? What, what's the next thing that happens in the Jewish wedding system? Taking the bride. Taking the bride. That's a little strange, especially in the U.S. and in, in the 21st century. He's like, what does that mean? That, that seems a little sexist. Take a bride, right? Does anyone have any idea what happens during the taking of the bride? The groom shows up unannounced, right. But before that, what, before the groom even launches off on his journey to go grab the bride, what has happened? Well, I'll tell you what happened. Who initiated the wedding in the first place? The father. And so, as the groom is off preparing a place, and he says, hey, dad, check it out. You like my place? I got this thing rocking and rolling for my, my bride. He's like, yeah, yeah, not yet, son. Yeah, that ain't. Those lines aren't straight. That's not happening. She ain't ready. In the Jewish context, it was the father which gave the son the authorization to go take the bride, right? So the father would look to the son and say, it's time, son, go get your bride. He'd be like, yes! He'd call all his friends, he'd call his friends, and then they would create this joyous, ruckus procession with trumpets blaring, people shouting. Normally it happened at night, I'll read you what... uh, uh, Dr. Geisler says here in a moment for all this procession, but 
the father would say to the groom, he'd say, go get your girl, son. Go get her. And he would get his pals together. They'd start a procession. They'd light the torches. Normally, it happened at night, often, is according to what we hear in history. They would have someone sh- uh, blowing the shofar, a bunch of trumpets. There'd be a bunch of shouting. And as they approached the bride's house, as they got close, a couple of the guys would launch out ahead of the, the party to warn the bride and say, he's coming. The bridegroom is coming. Prepare yourself. Get ready. Get dressed. Get up. Get up. Get up and get dressed. Take a bath. You hear the trumpets? He's coming. That's what was happening. Oh, wait. Did, did you hear some of the weird stuff we just talked about in Matthew chapter 25 and in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? And then when he got there, he would take the bride to himself and they would in in joyous procession, go back to the father's house, and then the fifth thing would, ha- or the fourth thing would happen, there would be a wedding ceremony. The wedding ceremony was far less elaborate than it is in the 21st century. It's all about the wedding ceremony for us, right? Now remember, in this context, in the Jewish context, they're already, but not yet married. In the 21st century context, we ain't even close to being married, and it's not a done deal until I say I do in front of some, some pastor or a judge or something, right? So, what we have is potentially our pre-understanding and that cultural disconnect can potentially blind us as we see this. In the Jewish context, the ceremony was a very intimate thing. The father would take them and accept them into the house. He would pronounce some blessings over them. They would share another cup or two. Then they would go to the wedding chamber, consummate the wedding behind closed doors, ideally, I hope, I think, I don't know, I've never found any of that, but at the end of that, they would come and show evidence of her purity to the intimate family, and immediately after that, the father would, show, would throw an all-out party known what we call the wedding feast. For seven days or more, it would be nonstop joy, happiness, I've read some people call it mirth. Has anybody heard the term mirth? I had to look up what mirth was. Mirth is joyous celebration. It's happiness. It's laughter. It's fun. They're having fun. It was a joyous occasion. They would do that for seven days, right? So what did, I, what did I, you just hear out of all that stuff for the wedding ceremony? In relationship to when you think about Jesus' return, when, when you hear someone teach and we had an excellent Sunday school, uh, Pastor Bob did an excellent Sunday school on eschatology, on the end times. Excellent job. Generally speaking, though, when, aside from our church, when you hear people teaching about end times, or when you hear about it, or when you start pondering it, if you ponder the end times, what are some of the thoughts you have? What are things that kind of perk up in your mind? Or when you look at the world situation, you hear persecution, okay? And, and in the persecution, are we happy about that? Going, God is true. He said we're going to be persecuted. In this world, you have persecution? Or do we go, ooh, ooh, all about that persecution. And so a little fear might grip us. What else? What else happens to us when we start talking about the imminent return of the bridegroom? Fear, right? What happens when we look at the world? It's, it's the beginning of 2024. And as we look over the horizon, we don't have crystal balls, but we can, you know, we can play out a little bit of going, <laughs> wow, there's a lot going on. So as we look at 2024, and then we look at the imminent return of Christ, what do you think? So honestly, what, what do we think, church? What are some? We know the end times are coming. And what, do, what sort of feelings, what sort of actions does that elicit within us? What's that? Trepidation. Trepidation, right? What else? Say that again just a little louder, sorry. The older I get, uh, that, I'm not going to get all that. The older I get, the more I look forward to Jesus' return. Because he will set everything straight, and the men of earth will not be able to oppress anymore. That's excellent. Thank you. You should write that down. Um, I agree with that, right? For most of us, though, 
when we look at the future? Does that, does that provide us with something to go, hey, check it out. Hey, brother, I just want to encourage you with this. People are talking about the economy bailing. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> but Jesus is coming back. Right? I'm just asking, right? I mean, or it's like, oh, I'm grieving over, name the thing. Oh, the loss of the nation, the loss of this, the loss of a daughter, the loss of a whatever. Remember what it said there? What, why did, what does 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 say? So we don't grieve like those without hope. How can this wedding system enable us to not grieve with no hope? What are the elements in here that we can look at and go, you know what? I can encourage you with that. I'm, I'm asking an honest question. What are some of the things that we can actually encourage one another with that? We're all going to be together again. We're all. True. I agree. We're all going to be together with those we lost and with Jesus. Excellent. And, and if we added on top of that and looked at the Jewish wedding system and apply that to the way we viewed it. Who set up our marriage with Christ? The Father did. The Father selected us as a bride. Who keeps us as a bride to the bridegroom? Who? The Father does. And the Holy Spirit that He's given us, right? Who were we betrothed to? And how did we become betrothed? We are betrothed to Christ, and how did that happen? Well, that's part of what's happening now as we're being sanctified, but we celebrated that this morning, right? In fact, is, let's turn there. Turn to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let me find it in my notes here so I don't mess this up. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25. And I would suggest that um, although we use it for the um, communion service, that this passage is a very rich and very deep marriage covenant verse. So let's read that really quickly here. Let me get there. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning of verse 25. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Hmm. What did we just say? What, what is our, what's our blessed hope as Christians? Jesus is our blessed hope, and his return is our blessed hope, right? So as Christians... Is it not true that we would want to encourage one another with that? And so, God the Father sets us up as the marriage. God the Father struck and negotiated the bride's price. Jesus paid the bride's price. Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit as the token. He's off preparing a place. He, the Holy Spirit is preparing us. And His imminent return is going to be preceded by all the things we read in here. So, as we... As we examine that, as we look at 2024, I would suggest these sort of things. That Jesus, it says in John chapter 6, uh, verse, beginning of verse 38, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is his will who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Christ in his return uh, will make much of his coming, and he will make much of his bride at his coming. And as we enter this new year, I just want to ask you two questions. What is it that you're longing for? What is, what is it? Peace. Okay. And, and what is the source of peace? If we're longing for peace, what is the source of peace? There it is. So church, allow yourself to ask the next question. So Peace is not a thing in and of itself. Peace emanates from the person of Christ. What captures your heart? As we sit here this morning, or this evening, this morning has already happened, this evening, what captures your heart's attention? I want to close with this, these few statements here. And I'd like you to just sort of imagine that I'm one of the bridegroom's friends, and that I'm in the street, and I'm yelling loudly, it's midnight, I have a torch in hand, you hear a trumpet shouting, 
are sounding in the distance, and you hear these words. The bridegroom, Jesus Christ, is coming. He is coming soon. Prepare the way of the Lord. Long for his appearing. Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the templates you give us. Thank you for revealing yourself in your word. Thank you for um, the example of the Jewish wedding ceremonies. Thank you that none of it depends on us. All of it depends wholly upon you. Thank you for leaving us the, the Holy Spirit who leads and guides us in the truth for your namesake. Father, I pray that you would cause us as a body to long for your appearing, that when fear grips our heart, God, that we would confess that, Father, that we would then lean into you and that you would renew our minds, renew our hearts, God. I pray that we would be a congregation <clears throat> and a people that's full of hope and a people who don't grieve like those who have no hope. It's not that we don't grieve, but we don't grieve like those that have no hope, Father. So be with us the rest of the night, Father, and as we go to work tomorrow, I pray that we would be beacons of life and of the wholeness of Christ, and that, Father, we would be ready in season and out to give a reason for the hope within us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand together and sing hymn 400 from Psalm 134, a familiar tune with a different text. Roger in dressing to us the great consummation of the ages and would 2024 be when Christ comes and may we earnestly yearn for that return of Christ as many as goals we have things we look forward to with it the return of Christ be greater um, before dismiss we you know we do have to move chairs sometime today and with this many people we could literally get done in a minute I'm just telling you but it's got to get stacked now we do have reception as well I'm appreciative of of my wife and Lucinda getting all this organized and any of you came to bring food and to be part of that and to hear and just to come to worship. I mean, that's a special time and to sit under God's words. So it's very good to be together. And so that's also available. Please, uh, yes, stay a few minutes and I'd love to agree with, with you during that time. And with that, receive the benediction of our God. Now may the grace for our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you today and forevermore. Amen. Julie, is there any other instructions? Okay, just head in the just head in the fireside room and, and come join us for reception. Magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. Too vast and astounding to tell Forever existing in worlds above Now offered and given to all O fountain of beauty eternal The Father
Father, the Spirit, the Son, sufficient, endless, generous, magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. Creation is brimming with thankfulness, the mountains exultant they stand. The seasons rejoice in your faithfulness, all life is sustained by your hand. You crown every meadow with color, you paint every shade in the sky. Each day the dawn wakes as an encore of and marvelous matchless love. The word is love endures forevermore. Magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. What grace that you entered our brokenness the fullness of time how far we have fallen from righteousness but not from the mercies of Christ your cross is our door to redemption your death is our fullness of life that day our forgiveness flowed as a His love endures forevermore. That a marvelous, matchless love. United in your resurrection, you lift us to infinite highs. Good Take us from magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. How great, how sure is love endures forevermore. Magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. How great, how sure is love endures. 